Welcome to Gold Money's 2020 Roundtable, when we discuss the outlook for precious metals for the rest of this year. To put it all into context, we will review 2019, cover the economic outlook, the credit cycle, financial and systemic risks, the outlook for currencies and financial markets, and of course, the developing threat of the coronavirus. My name is Alistair McLeod, and I'm head of research at Gold Money. With me is Roy Sabag, who's Chief Executive Officer. Also, we have a guest, Godfrey Bloom, who's an independent MEP before he retired. We also have Stefan Wheeler, who is a non-executive director of Gold Money, and James Turk, who is a lead director of Gold Money. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I think um, we should really kick off because um, Godfrey is here, uh, about um, our independence. We became independent as a nation once again after, was it 40 odd years? Something like that. Of, uh, yes. uh, and so um, I would be very interested in your take on our new independence. Will we succeed? And what have we left behind? Well, certainly, of course, we will probably succeed uh, if we fall back on our thousand years of independent history. <laughs> uh, our 40 years in the European Union was just a blip, really, a bit of a mistake, really, but there we are, every country makes mistakes. Uh, but what is the exciting thing about uh, Brexit, about getting back our independence, it's not just a constitutional matter, uh, which is getting back uh, our own rules and regulations, our own laws made by our own elected parliament within a, a parliamentary democracy and a constitutional monarchy, which is the uh, the position um, uh, from a constitutional point of view, that's very interesting, but for, for, for the purposes of this uh, uh, gathering, the exciting thing uh, is that we are going to be free of the stifling rules and regulations which the European Union turns out, has turned out over 40 years. Uh, and uh, to the extent of 2,000 new rules and regulations a year. And this is the kind of problem that you have with the legal system that they have in the uh, European Union, which is called corpus juris. It's sometimes referred to as the Napoleonic Code, uh, whereas in this country, of course, traditionally we've had statute law and common law. And the problem that gives uh, uh, has given us in the past, corpus juris or the N Napoleonic Code, uh, actually tells you that which you may do not which, that which you may not do. So it's very legalistic, it's very stifling, and it's very slow, and it's very bureaucratic. Whereas, historically, the reason that uh, uh, Great Britain has been such a successful trading empire was you can do anything you like, pretty much, as long as it's not forbidden, uh, which, of course, makes things a lot uh, more flexible. Uh, and we had, funnily enough, since the Bill of Rights in 1688, uh, we've, we had fewer laws passed in that time than we joined the European Union. Uh, and uh, since that time of joining the European Union in 1972, we, we uh, had more laws passed than we had in that entire period in between the 1688 Bill of Rights uh, and that period of joining, which gives you an idea of the scale uh, of uh, the rules and regulations which come out of the European Union on the nod, unbelievably quick, 200 perhaps a session, all costing money, uh, all costing jobs. So we're going to be free of that. Very, very exciting if our government doesn't drop the pass. Yes. If, they, <laughs> if they don't see, think that, the, that what we're free now of Brussels and regulation in Brussels, which is going to be replaced by Whitehall. Uh, we will be successful if the reform of the civil service and the reform of rules and regulations can come about. Uh, but that, there's a question mark over that at the moment. But I have to say, things are looking quite good at the moment. The Prime Minister's making all the right noises. Uh, and if we do get a totally and utterly clean break, uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be quite exciting. Do you think, um, on leaving the European Union, whether we have a trade agreement or not, do you think the trade agreement is going to matter? I mean, do you think the politicians um, uh, believe that uh, we can actually afford to walk away from the table in the trade negotiations which are meant to take place over the bulk of this year. Can we walk away, do you think? I've never been a big particular supporter of trade uh, trade, trade agreements. Trade agreements and restrictions. Yes, yes. Uh, because I think that they normally end up getting abused. They're uh, a cartel between politicians, uh, banks, 
bureaucrats. Uh, we trade perfectly well with the United States without an agreement. It's our biggest single trading partner. Uh, we have no uh, particular trade agreement with uh, China, uh, and you can't actually walk down the high street without seeing that every single thing you want to buy, from pots and pans to telephones, is all comes from China. We don't have an agreement. Uh, so trade agreements are really uh, uh, not as important as they're made out to be by politicians, of course, who've never had any experience of trade. Of trade. Can, can I, um, very, very briefly, and then we'll move on. Uh, one of the things that interests me is it seems that the European Union uh, think they've got a hold over us when it comes to giving the city permission to do business in the European Union. Now, I would have thought that at the retail level, all investment management businesses of any note have set up subsidiaries in Dublin or Luxembourg. So we're only talking about wholesale markets, aren't we? Yes, we are. I mean, I heard all this when the, uh, Great Britain didn't join the euro, uh, that the city of London would collapse and everything would go to uh, Frankfurt, which is a bit like suggesting that uh, fashion uh, would leave Paris and go to Oldham or Manchester. I mean, it was just <laughs> ludicrous. It's not going to happen. Uh, and of course, the European Union, we are their biggest customer. We are a monster uh, customer uh, for their cars, uh, automobiles. We take 80% of French wine, which my wife drinks most of. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they're talking a good story, but I don't think they've got it. Yeah. It won't make the Tupney Hapeness worth a difference. Right. OK. Thank you very much indeed for that. I think we can now move on to, if you like, the wider world. And I would like to start by asking Roy, what was 2019 for you? What was it like? What stood out for you? 2019 was a, an eventful year uh, for us uh, in the business, but also as it relates to global markets and the precious metal uh, environment. I think last year at this time, we made some pretty bold predictions that there were certain signals in the market and that people should now be very uh, strongly positioned in gold and some silver and that's uh, turned out quite well. So we're, we're very happy to see our customers uh, having gained about $900 million in wealth in the last 12 months. Um, the catalysts for uh, why gold specifically and other precious metals more broadly uh, rose in, in the way that they did, um, I think is a combination of a little bit of the old narrative that we're quite, quite well versed in, but also some surprises uh, the old narrative in terms of monetary debasement uh, saw really new lows in terms of the behavior of central banks around the world. I think the most important event of the year was by far uh, the period between August and September of 2019 uh, when equity markets began to drop uh, and we heard rumblings uh, from the financial system in New York City that some of these hedge funds that were engaged in some of these leveraged loan arbitrage strategies uh, were having a, a trouble dealing with their end-of-day collateral. And so uh, through the uh, mechanism of the uh, Federal Reserve Bank partners, we saw the Fed all of a sudden announce this, this repo. Uh, and at first, a lot of people were trying to you know, wrap their hand, heads around what is this repo, what is this reverse purchase agreement. But it became clear over the course of September that the Fed was really just growing its balance sheet again. And so this was QE uh, with a new name, uh, which, is, which is typical of, of what they've been doing. And so uh, with the benefit of hindsight, what I see uh, having happened is as follows. The Fed stepped in and stopped uh, shrinking its balance sheet, officially growing its balance sheet uh, from September onwards. Uh, I believe the number is uh, $600 billion or so in these repos. And what that did is it allowed the equity markets to go essentially parabolic, not just in the United States, but, but everywhere. And the type of stocks that started to appreciate were not the S&P 500 broadly, it was really the MAGA stocks, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Amazon. And those stocks, along with Tesla and some other stocks like uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, have, have really, in, in my whole career, I haven't seen uh, you know, a $30 billion company rise by 500% in 40 days. Uh, it really, uh, we saw this, this, this marriage of the speculative fervor, uh, tons of new retail interest from millennials that have never seen a bear market, uh, have no business trading, and, uh, and institutional investors that felt that, okay, the Fed has, has backstopped everything, and now we can keep rising to the moon. So 
from the perspective of equity markets, um, things got out of hand. And it was clear to professional, any professional investor that was observing the last two months, uh, I think all of us in some way, uh, either publicly or privately, discuss what we saw as this parabolic rise in equity indices. And so the, the new narrative is that while this was happening, we saw gold starting to rise quite aggressively uh, from October through January. And again, I, I personally have, haven't seen gold rise this quickly uh, since the 2004 to 7 period or 2011 to 13. And so I think it was signaling something to us, even in that first rise from 1300 to 1450. There were these massive candles and it just started to uh, really feel like something changed. And as the markets uh, began to deal with this new threat of coronavirus, which is part of this new narrative, uh, which, which I think I want to I spend a lot of time on. Essentially, the, the new narrative to me is that people, participants in the real economy are beginning to recognize that central banks cannot cure problems in the real economy. The only thing that they can cure is the value of assets through monetary debasement. But any reduction in aggregate demand, any social or cultural reason to refuse to cooperate or slow down the rate of cooperation is something entirely outside the realm of the central bank to cure. Uh, you know, put simply, a central bank can't cure a cold by printing money. It can't cure a virus. And so I've seen this shift in, the, in that perception, both in the real economy, but also with institutional investors. And I think that was what we've seen in the last three weeks which is a complete collapse in equity markets globally, uh, new lows in terms of bond yields globally, and also very good performance for precious metals, notwithstanding what took place the last week, which I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss. So that's how I see uh, 2019. Well, that's very interesting. And I think, so to sum up, I think what you're saying is that the investing public have a very high level of complacency about what what was developing last year. And when you look at the repo market, um, really what the Fed was doing was having to inject liquidity into the money markets in New York because all that extra five and a half, six trillion that has been chucked into uh, the monetary system since Lehman seems somehow to evaporate it in terms of liquidity. That's very interesting. Um, James, how, how's um, 2019 been? from your perspective. Well, it was a very important year with regard to the precious metals. Um, you know, gold has been rising since December of 2015. Uh, in the first couple of years, nobody was really paying attention, which is typical in a bull market, but um, that's where the undervalued assets are. And it, as 2019 came along, uh, people started recognizing that there were a lot of overvalued assets around the world and very few undervalued, precious metals being among the few undervalued assets. So gold actually rose 18% last year as it gar garnered, uh, garnered more attention. Um, and what I'm talking here, of course, is about people buying physical gold because of the advantages that physical gold has over paper representations of gold. Uh, so to me, this was, I think, an important year indicating, as you said, the complacency is disappearing and people are starting to look now more as to where the values are and how they should be positioning their portfolios. Because obviously the key is you get rid of the overvalued assets and you accumulate the undervalued assets. And the precious metals, despite the good performance over the past couple of years, remain undervalued. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, I mean, it seemed to me that um, the, you know, the precious metals had a really good run. I think it was a bit earlier than you suggested. It looked to me as if it took, out in a, took off in about August. Yeah. And um, there was from time to time, I felt anyway, um, uh, evidence, if you like, of central banks finding that they were subtly altering their positions from being, well, we can let it rise, we can hit the market uh, by just printing futures and take out all the stops, uh, get all our positions back, and then be in a position for the next, next run, which is sort of more or less how they run the COMEX market. A managed retreat, uh, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, immensely profitable too, because, um, you know, the, the speculators, because they divide it into, you know, if you like, the sort of, you know, professionals and speculators, or the producers and speculators, I think is the term. Um, the producers always control the market. That's the whole point. That's why the banks are in there. Um, and the speculators always get taken for a ride. This time, it wasn't quite the same. I mean, when the market started taking off in August, um, 
it just sort of felt like quite a few of the um, bullion banks were beginning to turn um, turn around and think we don't want to be quite as short as we might otherwise have been in the past. And what was interesting was the way in which um, this was followed by an explosion in open interest yeah. when the previous high, which I think was about 630,000 con contracts, it just blown through and we ran up to almost 800,000 contracts. I mean, this is just which is unbelievable. Which twice the yeah. open interest of 2011 when we were at 1900. Absolutely, and yes. And, and equates to about, what, two years of annual production? Uh, I haven't worked that one out, but it one must year. be mm, one year. It's, one it's year. a good. I, yeah. I do have an insight about this. So my sources at Precious Metal Bullion Banks are telling me that what they have seen from central banks in the last six months is that because of the treasury yields being so low and because of the backwardation in, in gold futures, mm. Uh, they've been seeing central banks leasing metal to bullion banks to capture an arbitrage, a spread above their treasury yield. Now, these are foreign central banks, which unfortunately I can't mention. I do know which ones, but I can't mention. Um, and my uh, sources are telling me they haven't seen that kind of activity ever, really, or in years. Uh, so, so, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it increased in the last few weeks. Uh, so I think that that might explain the, the, the explosion in open interest. It's Which, interesting because yeah. it goes back to Alan Greenspan's quote in 1999 that should the price rise, central banks will lease more gold. Now, obviously, they want to earn a higher level of interest, but they're also serving a secondary purpose of adding that supply into the market to keep the gold price suppressed to make their currencies look better. Exactly. Yes, I mean, this is something which uh, I think was a, uh, an analyst called Frank Veneroso, going back to round about the turn of the millennium. Yeah, 1997, his gold uh, study. Yeah, and he was, he was talking about, uh, I think, something like somewhere between 10 and 15,000 tons of central bank gold was out on lease mm -hmm. to provide the liquidity in the market, as it were. So we're returning to those days. This, I mean, would I be right in thinking that this smells like a suppression game as much, more than anything else? Yeah, so, so the, you know, the overt argument is that they're generating a risk-free yield, but of course the, uh, the underlying reason most likely is to, is to slow down the rate of change. I think it's mysterious that the open interest on the COMEX never seems to, uh, it, it's almost like it never seems to ever revert to the mean. It mm. always just keeps growing exponentially. And Annual gold production has declined for the first time uh, last year in, I believe, a decade. Yeah. And we now can, we have visibility based on the uh, in situ resources of the leading gold miners that the, both the quality of the reserves, but also their annual head grades are declining. So I, I personally believe that we've reached peak gold uh, in terms of what we're able to produce economically you know, through a $2,000, $2,500 an ounce level. So the open interest explo exploding while uh, the amount of gold that's being produced is declining mm. and the open interest never declining seems to imply that uh, someone is leasing gold long term and providing this col collateral to the, to the precious metal bullion banks. It never takes losses on their shorts. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Who would do that other than central banks? Well, yeah. exactly. Well, and the sad part about that is it, it doesn't even cost them that much money. Hmm. It's, it's a few but, billion dollars. But yeah. the problem is, will they get it back? Someone, I mean, yeah, some, it, someone has to ask for it. But, but you see, I, I'm not so worried about these kinds of arguments because the physical market ultimately clears. And I think that the, the only thing that the futures casino can achieve is to temporarily suppress the price discovery yes. process. Mm. Uh, in the end, physical markets clear. Uh, obviously, yeah. Stefan knows a lot about this too. So I see it as more shaking out the speculators mm. and the weak hands. But at the end of the day, whether it's industry, whether it's uh, long-term uh, monetary ownership of gold, those uh, two trends are only going up. Uh, central banks have bought more gold in the last few years than ever before in history. The, the net amount of tons that are owned by central banks is only rising. We're also seeing central banks increasingly want to repatriate their gold from the uh, Bank of England. So I know that Poland has publicly done so. I know of other ba uh, central banks that have done so quietly. We all know the story about Germany. So I think 
the physical market will resolve itself and we shouldn't pay too much attention to the spot markets in the futures. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'd now like to ask Stefan, what was 2019 for you? And I should say at this juncture that Stefan's um, uh, enormous capability is really in energy markets. That's, that's um, you, you know more about energy than all of us combined and then some. So how was 2019 for you? Before I talk about energy markets, maybe I would like to add one thing um, specifically to the gold market. And um, we have discussed this before. We have developed this uh, um, basically pricing model for gold that shows that the gold prices are mostly driven by real interest rate, changes in real interest rate expectations and longer dated energy prices. And I remember last time we actually had this round table. We sat down and um, I think we all felt the same thing that what has really changed at the time was that there was really no risk anymore that the Fed would be able to hike rates anymore. That was basically what we discussed and we said, okay, this is it right, right now. Kind of the risks to gold price to the downside is now fairly off the table. Um, and that's basically how it played out in 2019, right? So um, we haven't seen massive cuts. But what we have seen is that the Fed has completely reversed um, its, uh, its tapering. So they, instead of selling back assets to the market, they actually have completely reversed um, in what is now referred to in the market as non-QE, but it's just another form of QE. And actually, if you look at the speed at which non-QE has been deployed, this was much faster than, than actually selling the assets back to the market. Um, and as a result, um, real interest rates have been dropping and gold prices really are now on the rise. Um, and, and I think 2019, I completely agree, this is just the start. I mean, there's, at this point, there's really not much chances that you see any hikes anytime soon and, and however they want to do it, but real interest rates have to go down from here and that's kind of what the market well, is facing. Well, if anything, they're not talking about further cuts. Um, but anyway, we're going to get on to yeah, 2020 absolutely. in a moment. I mean, on the energy side, it has been it has been an interesting time. So 2019, um, energy markets, particularly oil, actually were fairly tight, um, but only because um, OPEC started to cut production quite dramatically, and uh, because actually demand growth wasn't very strong, um, and that's because economic growth wasn't very strong in 19. And what we actually have seen is that um, that oil demand growth in the second half of 19 had dramatically collapsed um, to the point where it was barely positive year over year at the end of 19. And we only see these kind of things when typically when economic growth is really weak. So um, a rule of thumb is that oil demand grows roughly at the speed of global economic GDP, at minus 2%. So if you have flat demand growth, this would really imply that global economic growth was uh, just about 2% at the end of 19, which by any means would be already in a recession. Um, but oil prices actually kept stayed fairly high throughout 19 because OPEC kept on cutting and then he had a lot of involuntary cuts uh, from Venezuela, uh, from Iran, um, and now at the beginning of this year from Libya as well. So it was actually, it was a very exciting 12 months, the past 12 months where he had I think more geopolitical events in oil than we have seen in, in a decade, right? You had uh, the, the airstrike that killed uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, you had the Iranian retaliation, um, you had um, you had Abu Kaik. I mean, that was that was actually that showed you actually Abu Kaik is a very good point. It showed you how weak the market was because that is basically the most prominent target you could possibly think of <laughs> in the oil market. There's nothing that comes close to this. It's it's five percent of the global oil market. Had they been able to penetrate those tanks and it would have exploded, I mean that would have been that would have been like a once in a hundred year kind of event. Um, and oil the oil prices spiked um, on the day when it happened 
but then it, they, it, within seven days, they were actually below where they started. So that already gave you a sense of how weak demand must be. As I understand it, I mean, I remember uh, our conversation from last time, and um, you um, told me something I didn't really understand before, that actually the right price for oil is always out along the futures curve. That, if you like, reflects the real supply and demand, and the variation in the price is really because of, well, if I, I, I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit, but... Uh, it's because of what's in the pipeline. You've got, you know, times of delivery and all this sort of stuff and low inventory. Yes. So you can get enormous volatility. So, I mean, what we have seen, and again, I'm coming, coming forward a little bit, we've seen a massive drop in the price of oil in the last week. I mean, this is recorded uh, on the 29th of February, by the way, so markets have taken quite a change. But we have seen a very big drop in the price of oil. What's happened out at the other end of that futures curve? Is it still stable or is it reflecting changes? Uh, yeah, in... it, has been, it has been remarkably stable um, in, um, in years now, but um, over the past four weeks or so, the back end of the curve actually started uh, to come down a little bit, not dramatically so. I think the market is now pricing in that OPEC probably has to cut more production right. and that would build a lot of spare capacity. So the idea that um, from 2021, which was everybody in the oil market kind of had in their books that from 2021 it gets really, really tight, mm -hmm. you're basically pushing that out um, with the, the demand destruction we're seeing right now. So you're going into 2021 and then maybe even 2022 with a large amount of OPEC spare capacity, especially should um, all that lost production from Iran, Venezuela and Libya come back, you're sitting on a really large cushion of spare capacity and you don't need desperately these investments in, in new production, um, w which is something we actually previously the market was convinced yeah. that co coming from next year is going. Um, but it hasn't moved that much yet. Um, it also, it's important to know that the back end of the curve has been really depressed for years now because the shale oil producers in the US and they have, they shown, have shown relentless growth in production. And they're basically forced by the banks to hedge all their forward supply in order to roll their credits. So every time the, the price, um, the next year's price is rising, they're just selling just the market. Yeah. And so that has depressed the price to a point where I in my view, it was way too low to encourage investment in, in conventional supply. Mm. Um, and that actually sets the stage, and the stage was set for 2021, but maybe now we postpone this a little bit, but that would have set the stage for a massive price rise when we actually come to the point where uh, non-OPEC production is tipping over and is outright declining and demand, despite all the push to a greener economy, demand will still grow for, for a number of years. I actually have a question for you, uh, which is apropos of this. So in my view, oil is a signal of deflation, right? It's, it's indicating that people are cooperating at a, at a lower rate than the prior rate. And so less cooperation, less consumption of energy, and oil is an important symptom of that, that we should be following. Not the only one, but a very important one. Do you believe today, uh, intuitively, because I, I think it's not yet clear to anyone, if the price of oil has been declining the way it has in the last six months because there is massive structural deflation, so slower rate of cooperation even before coronavirus, or because it has to do with something in terms of this belief in the green economy that we're going to replace hydrocarbons and oil, and so the, the invisible hand is simply predicting that the price of oil uh, has to decline uh, because the, the, the number of barrels consumed, demanded every day will decline. I think it's two things and the latter is definitely one factor in my view. So if you talk to professionals, traders in the oil industry, they do see this push to a greener economy um, leading to peak demand much sooner than we have previously thought. Mm. Now. There's still, there's still a number of years to go. It's just not fast enough. Even if you push with policy and everything, you, you, 
you just can't build it fast enough. There's like a billion vehicles in the world with uh, internal combustion engines, and we're selling a hundred million, we produce a hundred million per year, roughly. Um, and only a small percentage of the new cars are not with an internal combustion engine, whether it's battery cars um, or it's some sort of hybrid or something. Um, and so in order to kind of turn over your, your uh, vehicle fleet, this will take many, many years, even, even actually if the growth of uh, if the sales growth um, of electric vehicles continues to grow at this kind of exponential rate, which at the moment it's not really that fast anymore. So, but it's definitely one part, I agree. Um, I think the other part is really has to do again with central banks. Um, they, we had, we had such extremely low rates that allowed these um, new kids on the blocks, the shale oil producers in the US, to grow production at an exponential rate. And this should have never happened, right? So this is not efficient what we're doing there. Um, these, these companies are hanging on to a thread. They're not profitable. They're destroying more than 50 cents on the dollar we have given them over the past 10 years. And by the way, it's not such shale oil producers, it's pretty much any oil producer. It's just that shale oil producers are even worse than the majors. Um, but they're actually destroying money, we give them. <laughs> um, and these companies, they are at the brink of bankruptcy. They should have never been allowed to borrow at the rates they did. But they did, and they put this money into production. So we have seen this amazing production growth. And at the same time, as I mentioned before, they keep on selling the back end. So that's, I think, is the second factor why it has been so low. So the market has been unable to actually price in real, real fundamentals in the forward curve. What, what percentage of oil demand is automotive? So let's say the entire fleet becomes electrified by 2030. So there's your billion vehicles. But what does that do to, to net barrels, demand for net barrels? Yeah, it depends a bit. So in, in the Western economies, it's very high. Um, globally, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but transportation is probably in the order of 70, 75%. So that includes jet fuel? Yes, and ships and everything. Yeah. Um, which, which we can't replace with electric batteries. Uh, probably not with batteries, but I mean, there is obviously th these guys are thinking about this as well, right? Um, so you could replace it with something that is based on methanol or e-methanol, they're calling it, which you produce with wind and then you would make some sort of fuel that is basically not net adding any carbon and they might actually have to do that to um, fulfill customer demand. Cruise ships, for instance, are probably prone to this kind of changes that they need to prove that they're not polluting the environment, so they probably need to fall back to some sort of fuel that, sh in theory, shouldn't add any carbon to, um, to the environment. Uh, then, on the other hand, like freight ships, what is kind of the majority of, of ocean uh, transportation, those, those won't change. But it is a huge problem. I mean, uh, um, I think I'm right in saying that something like 98% of all logistics is driven by diesel. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge figure like yes. that. Yeah. And they're talking about, um, you know, becoming fully el electric by, in this country by 2035, in Europe by 2040, depending which country you're talking about. This is a huge, huge change. I mean, um, I'm wandering off oil a little bit. I mean, obviously it does affect um, uh, the, the demand side for, for energy, but um, I just wonder whether they'll ever achieve it. Um, <laughs> Godfrey, now, presumably in your um, eerie back in Yorkshire, you have been watching the European situation with interest. So how was 2019 for you? Well, I have to say the first time, uh, it's, it's, it's the first time I've been wrong. Uh, I honestly didn't believe that we would really leave. Uh, I thought what the Americans, with their wonderful gift for, for phraseology, uh, I didn't think we could beat deep state. Uh, we had a situation, if we go back to the beginning of 2019, uh, where mainstream media was Remain, uh, almost totally Remain, that's BBC, Channel 4, ITV, all our TV channels were Remain, most newspapers were Remain, uh, the uh, bureaucracy, the foreign office, uh, 
totally remain. Mm -hmm. It wasn't possible in the United Kingdom to be promoted above one star rank in the uh, civil service without actually being a totally committed Remainer. Um, and of course we had a House of Lords which is totally Remain and a House yep. of Commons which is majority Remain and still is. Mm. Uh, so this has been a fascinating political battle. This is ordinary working Joes, the ordinary what the Americans called Joe Sixpack beating deep state, uh, which I didn't think was possible. Uh, so I thought we would leave, uh, if we did leave, it would be fake. Uh, it would be some sort of associate membership. I didn't think we'd get a clean break. We still need to see whether we will or won't. Mm. The game's not fully over yet, uh, but it really does look like we are going to. Uh, and so, uh, yes, I, I started the year feeling pretty gloomy about it um, because I've been committed to uh, returning Great Britain to self-government now for 30 years, and uh, it looks like it's going to happen. I'll have to find something else to moan about. <laughs> So I, I actually have two questions for you, and I think one of the questions could uh, turn into a greater discussion. The first is, who do you think will be next to leave the European Union? I still keep in touch with people with fingers on the pulse. Um, and of course, as the, the obvious ones, I was in Hungary last year uh, in, in, in Budapest, and of course they are very disenchanted indeed uh, with the European Union, but they are still significant net recipients of European largesse. Uh, the same could probably be said of the Poles, who are also fed up with the European Union. Interesting, the Czechs, uh, uh, the Czech Republic is very fed up with the European Union. Um, and of course, the Czechs have a history, uh, they're now suddenly beginning to realize, and I was in Poland and Warsaw a little while ago, and these countries which are relatively newcomers to the European Union are going, this is beginning to look like what we just got out of. Yes. Uh, this is a beginning to look like a sort of Soviet empire where everything is centralized in Brussels, one size fits all, uh, with a totally unelected uh, administration uh, and the new, uh, uh, all the new people that have come in with this new parliament, none of whom have really been elected. The only people who've been elected are members of the European Parliament and of course it's an amending chamber. Yeah. It isn't a lawmaking body for people who may not know this. Most British people don't know that. Uh, so I'm sure any of probably watching uh, from America won't know that. So uh, it has no um, uh, uh, dynamic, uh, democratic dynamic at all. Uh, and, and so people are beginning to notice this. And of course, Italy are much more volatile and vociferous as the Italians always are. Bless them, I love Italy. Um, uh, and of course, the French, Marine Le Pen, is now nosing ahead, uh, I think, of Macron. She only needs a, a few more points. Uh, her, uh, her economic policies are absolutely crazy, but she is a very, very committed French patriot uh, who's growing uh, in popularity all the time. So who's going to leave, which was your question, mm -hmm. who might leave first? No, no idea. No idea. But Do you predict we'll have another country leave in the next 24 months? I would think probably yes. But who it will be, I really couldn't say. Or, of course, the whole thing might come tumbling down. Yeah. It might not be a question of somebody leaving. It might be a question of the thing imploding, which is as highly likely in the next 24 months as anything else. Well, and that's we... why you always want to be the first one to leave a party. It, well, you do. Yeah. <laughs> you do. Um, we haven't left yet. <laughs> the, the, the second question, which I think we should open up to everyone, is you, you raise this uh, surprise in terms of the David and Goliath battle between the Joe Six Pack and the uh, and the political elite, and that surprise has been occurring now all over the world for the last few years. Uh, it's it's branded uh, as populism in some ways, nationalism. Um, in in the United States, we call it the flyover states. Um, I believe that the reason we're seeing those surprises is because of the central banking policies of the last 30 or 40 years. The, the, the politicians and the central banks have hollowed out the whole relationship between labor, time, uh, cooperation. They have completely bifurcated the wealth effect such that there are people that have no sense of human dignity anymore. 
But in this terms is quite true. The crisis coming. I managed pension funds uh, for all oh, 30 years. Uh, fixed interest aspect of pension funds are rather unfashionable, uh, but uh, I did that for many, many years. And of course, we have a forthcoming pension crisis in this company because pension funds are based on yield. Uh, they're not based on capital values. A lot of people make that mistake. They're based on yield. So bond yields in particular, sovereign debt uh, uh, yields in particular, uh, equity yields, with all these things that we haven't seen for, for many years now, uh, it's based on income. And we've seen the degradation of money. And who does that affect, of course? That affects people on fixed incomes, old age pensioners, and again, ordinary Joe Sixpack, or we used to say, the man on the clap of, chaps of our age, the man on the clap of omnibus. Uh, so yes. Uh, you're absolutely right, uh, and the whole thing is this: uh, is this unholy alliance between politicians, uh, big business, and the bureaucracy and the banks. And of course, if you look at the definition of the uh, of, of the beginning of the concept of fascism in Italy in the 1920s, that is exactly what we've got. We have a fascist system and I don't use the term as a pejorative term which is uh, you know uh, we're here in Oxford it's you know they shout fascism racist you know it comes up with the rations doesn't mean anything these days but fascism is a political dynamic and it was invented in the in 1920s nearly 100 years ago uh, and that is what we've actually got and there is this pushback and of course the first pushback one might argue was in America when they elected Trump and with a flyover states and I understand all that point. But if you remember why Trump, one of the platforms that Trump got elected on, of course, was to bring the boys home, to stop this ludicrous thousand overseas United States bases, uh, 200,000 overseas military personnel, uh, which is positively crazy, damaging the American economy. And he said he's going to stop that because it's nonsense. And of course, he hasn't. Uh, so actually, Trump's history of fighting deep state is mixed. Uh, and the jury, of course, is still out on Boris Johnson and this ad administration, this government. The jury is out. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to pan out. Uh, but I, I'm more interested in the, in the story of the individual that's basically uh, entered into a social contract with his fellow uh, cooperative uh, community and with his political leaders. And something seems to have shifted in their sense to recognize that the system itself is, is rigged against me. Uh, there's a glass ceiling above my wages. Uh, I will never be able to accumulate capital and my cost of living is rising too rapidly. And I, it's almost as though we've transitioned now from the economic sphere where guys like, like us are debating the Keynesians uh, into this political sphere where it's either going to uh, fork into socialism or populism, but I, I'm not quite sure in this election cycle if the populists are, are going to be as strong as the socialists. I could only talk about this country and yeah. uh, uh, the United Kingdom. There was a lot of people saying oh, that we had the referendum leave and remain. They said, oh, old people voted remain and young people voted leave, which of course is complete nonsense. That's not, if you look really carefully at the figures, uh, there, is a, uh, there is this dynamic of leave and remain. The people who voted remain work in the public sector. It's the public sector where they are part of the bureaucracy, they're part of deep state, they have index linked pensions, they have pensions that are impossible to find in the private sector over here. Mm. And you have the butcher, the baker, the cab driver and the hairdresser over here who voted leave, who've been suffering uh, from this raft of legislation, rules and regulations, and realise that they haven't actually really moved on and they're working harder than ever. So that is your split. Uh, your split is not just your administration of deep state, which is your bureaucracy and your banks and your politicians, but it actually comes right down horizontally to the ordinary man in the high street. Uh, and uh, that's where your split is. And, and, uh, and that is what is going to be interesting to see that develops in all the democracies, because it's just the same. It's equally true of France, incidentally. Yep. Uh, and of course, there are huge riots every day, uh, every weekend in France. I mean, really quite desperate riots, which, of course, is a D notice on in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom or an implied D notice. These are not recorded. The BBC, Channel 4, uh, Sky, they will not show you these riots in France. Everything is fine. It's all covered up. And of course, you have to see this. You see it on social media. Uh, so it's actually getting quite sinister.
You know, you yeah. raise an interesting point. It's something that I've been sort of wrestling with because if you look at history over hundreds and hundreds of years, you go through these cycles and the, the, the society structure changes over time. You know, feudalism eventually ended. And the question you're sort of raising is central bankingism. Uh, coming to an end. Uh, you know, I always like to say that central banks are the barbarous relic. And I think it's become more and more true that they are because they're destroying the capitalist society that's enabled individuals to improve everyone's standards of living by applying labor and capital, you know, as we all know. So to me, this is a more fundamental question that I think we have to be focusing on here. What is the impact if it is going to be a major structural change in society uh, as central banking has come to an end and it's being reflected in the fact that people, like you say, are starting to vote. Uh, they're voting with their, uh, in the ballot box. Maybe they're also voting now with their, uh, their feet in terms of you know, moving different parts of the world and maybe voting with their pocketbook as well. Indeed. I I think what I would like to say um, about 2019, I think we, we can move on a little bit, is that um, we have seen the end of the credit cycle. I always call it a credit cycle because we need to make the distinction between a cycle of business activity that is driven by the public sector, which is a credit cycle with the aid of commercial banks, and a business cycle which is how it is, is, it is described by governments and by central banks, the implication being that it is the private sector that is responsible for the cycle, and they are not. So the credit, I think to understand it as a credit cycle is extremely important. And um, to that, though, the impact on money and currency, because when you're talking about the credit cycle in two different sectors, what we've been living with is more and more government debt is being transformed into currency. Yeah. And that's historically proven to be a bad thing. Yeah. because ultimately the currency is debased and essentially destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. What concerned me um, when we met last time was I could see this dynamic arising whereby um, the President Trump was um, in a full-out tariff war against China, um, and those threats, thank goodness, have receded, but, but there are still tariffs there, and the damage has been done. Um, this, to me, was a dead ringer for what happened in 1929 to 1932. In those years, you'd had the expansion of the quantity of money in circulation and bank credit through the 1920s, which was something that um, uh, Coolidge, uh, the president, didn't understand. He was, a, he was the last real free marketeer, um, it, as it were, as a, as a president, but he didn't understand the money, which was a mistake. So we had that expansion. It was a boom. It was the roaring 20s. It was all lovely, but there was that degree of falseness in it because it was just extra money. On top of that, on October the 30th, 1929, Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. That was the month when Wall Street fell 20, I think no, it was 35% from top to bottom. I mean, it was a yeah. huge, huge, great fall. And subsequently, it went on to fall after President Hoover, who it was then, signed this into law, which he did the following May, June, round about then, the market then just slid down and down and down and down, such that at the end, by around about the middle of 1932, it had lost 90% from the top. I mean, this was a major change. This time round, we have the end of the credit cycle, which has been far larger. I mean, the amount of money involved is got far larger. And we have also had trade tariffs protectionism. Now, the tariffs are considerably less than those that were proposed by or in, indeed enacted by Smoot-Hawley, the average tariff rate by Smoot-Hawley raised it from the Ford and McCumber rates, which at the beginning of the 1920s were around about 30% on average, to around about 60%. Huge, huge, great hit. The dynamics are different, but having said that, you've still got those two dynamics there. So we could see this beginning to happen in 2019, and to my mind, it was setting us up for the potential of a real crisis in 2020. Now, things have moved on slightly and we'll, we'll discuss 2020 in a moment, but I think we should um, accept that the reason that the economy is in mortal danger, the global economy is in mortal danger, is that every central bank in the world of note has been doing exactly the same thing, puffing up the amount of money, 
America is the only one so far that has been doing anything with the tariffs, and I don't think anyone else will do it. We're coming out of a tariff zone, so hopefully we will be cheerleaders for free trade. But the damage is done, and so this is what we face, I think, coming out of 2019. Um, when I look back to the repo crisis, I mean, that is such an interesting situation because... Um, to my mind, the dynamics in this are that the foreigners, up until 2019, had been uh, more or less financing the budget deficit through recycling their, um, the, the dollars, the net dollars that they gained through their trade surpluses. Um, indeed, if you look at the amount of money that the foreigners now have invested in the U.S. economy, which is around about 24, 25 trillion dollars, more than the U.S. GDP, it actually equates quite well with the amount of debt that's been issued by the US government. So um, we now have a situation where the foreigners are beginning with this cycle to sort of draw in their horns. So the Fed has the problem that in the money markets in New York, you don't have the credit being created by the banks, if you like, for the dollars to be recycled by foreigners, I mean, it goes via various routes, so I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. You don't have the dollars being created um, uh, as a result or remaining in the system as a result of the trade deficit. The banks are having to take on, through their, their um, uh, prime dealers, they're having to take on inventory in the form of government debt. And at the same time, some very large hedge funds have been stripping out the yield differential between um, you know, the minus half percent in euros and, I mean, it's, it's gone down now, but you know, it's sort of plus two percent um, in, or maybe a little bit more in dollars. And they've been doing this through the, the FX swaps market. So it may not be a hedge fund doing it directly, but the banks who are providing the facilities have been shorting euros, shorting yen, and buying dollars, and buying US T-bills and short-dated treasuries with coupons. So we have a problem, a liquidity problem, which means that the whole of the system has now run into real problems. And the real problem is that the big banks can no longer create the credit to replace, if you like, those dollars that were flowing in and uh, staying in um, uh, the United States by foreigners. Uh, with surplus dollars. They're now sort of going out of it. And so we have um, a credit crisis developing. And on one day in September, I think it was uh, early September, suddenly the repo rate shot up to 10% intraday. Yeah. And, um, you know, what has happened since is that, and this is a point that you were making, is that since then they've been doing sham QE, if you like, um, injecting money into the system injecting into the money into the system to keep it going and also to ensure the primary dealers can hold on to <laughs> that inventory which they've had to build up. So um, in doing that, really what they're telling us is that with the squeeze in the money markets, actually the right interest rate in the United States money markets is far higher than the current level. And now we come on to a crisis and I think perhaps we'll do that in part two. So, moving on from last year, we're now looking at 2020. And we have to mention, I'm afraid, the coronavirus, which is now in, in the headlines for everything, almost to the exclusion of everything else. I'd be very interested in your take, uh, Stefan, about how it is affecting Europe, because you've flown in from Switzerland for this. Um, I mean, in England, we don't seem to worry about it too much, but from what you were saying before we sat down to talk about this, um, it really is changing the way people are behaving, going into their offices and so on. And presumably this will have a huge economic effect. Um, what's your perspective on that? Well, flying in this morning, I was actually quite surprised. The airport was still full and, and a lot of, actually a lot of passengers came in. The flight out was maybe half full, but I expected definitely fewer passengers on the plane. Given what we are actually seeing in Switzerland, being just next to Italy, which is one right now, one of those epicenters where the virus spreads quite rapidly. Uh, what we've seen last week is really that a lot of companies in Switzerland started to um, assess the situation, um, allow people to work from home. It's not forced yet, uh, but definitely um, all non-essential travel has been canceled 
I would say probably at most companies at this point. So this, this is to conferences and also... Yeah, the conference, the, conference them, the conference basically, they, they are all cancelled anyway. So everything is cancelled. Uh, all the conferences we wanted to go, you couldn't even go, even if we are allowed to. Um, in Switzerland itself, they're cancelling a lot of like the large conferences. The Geneva Car Show just has been cancelled. Basel World has been cancelled. Um, so we see this all over Europe. Um, Obviously, because we're so close to Italy and Milan has been particularly impacted by this, so that they're actually it's slowing down already dramatically. We're seeing people um, definitely emptying some of the shelves at the supermarkets with non-perishable food. Um, there you can't buy any baking powder, baking soda, and dry yeast and that kind of stuff anymore. Um, That's interesting. So, so but, even, but, even but, though the very, very few people um, have been registered as having contracted the coronavirus, you're saying that there's a sort of panic on where it's people not are... yet. I wouldn't say it's panic yet, yeah. but people see what's going on in Italy and it's really close to home. Mm -hmm. they, uh, we have a lot of Italians that cross the border all the time. A lot of Swiss just go to Italy, it's like Milan is so close, you just drive. Um, and it's quite obvious that people got infected there, now returning, and, and it will eventually spread um, and we're actually looking at Italy and we see how they closed down these towns that were um, affected. Um, what about on the energy market? How do you see that impact? Yeah, so that's a, di that's a different story. I mean, energy, like, um, energy markets are um, extremely impacted, mostly oil, but generally across the board, everything is down. So, um, and we already have been in a bear market in most energy markets, but oil. So gas has been very weak for months now, but it's going, it's getting completely crashed both in Europe and in the US. Um, LNG cargoes are being rejected. There's force majeure on Chinese um, intake of LNG. So they end him up now in Europe, which we have no other, Europe had no, um, no reason to declare force majeure yet, but China could. Um, they still debated whether they actually allowed to declare force majeure on this, but Can what we know is this gets coming back. Declaring force majeure, I mean, d it effectively means they're refusing to take delivery of um, LNG yeah. uh, deliveries, which which so, they've paid for or haven't. So paid for? the LNG market is uh, there is a spot market in LNG and it's growing really fast, but most of the LNG market in the world is still term markets. So these very long term contracts between the buyers and the producers, places like Qatar, etc. They have basically almost everything in long term contracts and Chinese have been a large buyer of it. Asia is a very large taker of LNG. Japan used to be the largest importer of LNG. Now it's actually surpassed by China. Um, and the Chinese companies, they basically declare force majeure on their long-term contracts. So they're not buying? They're not taking it anymore. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's a first. China, historically, has always uh, wanted to buy stuff, uh, especially commodities. There's no, there's no use for it. They can't store it anymore if they're not, wow. if they're not using it. There's not enough storage to take these. So and then on the oil side, there, the, I think the impact is the most dramatic because what is really, really impacted now is transportation uh, more than anything else. So obviously there is an economic impact. We just have seen the Chinese um, data um, and it looks terrible. Um, but um, the transportation fuel impact is much, much larger than the economic impact. So um, China's oil demand is about 13 million barrels per day. It's the second largest um, oil consumer in the world and we can only estimate where it is right now but we think it's somewhere in the order of three to four million barrels a day of, a huge, of the huge demand reduction. hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean what happens to all that excess? I mean does it all sort of pile up somewhere? Or? Yeah, right now it's piling up in China um, so they actually stored a lot of it um, and the question really is when do they run out of storage? <laughs> Um, if this continues to go on, they're probably still going to take it, they refine it, and then it will export the refined products. And that's really when it's going to hit the market. So it's really the question is, can China go through this V-shaped recovery and then basically start eating through the inventories they've built? You're now introducing a scenario in my mind that I just considered. So if this continues, this will begin to affect the oil producers 
Yes. Which, which will then in turn affect their ability to maintain their foreign ownership of treasuries. Yes. So think of a Saudi Arabia or uh, uh, Iraq or any of these countries, if, if they can no longer, uh, if they have to shut down production so that nominally they're producing less dollars, the mar the, as a marginal buyer of dollar-denominated assets, that declines significantly. It, so well, this could be a terrible feedback. Yeah. So what the, what the oil market is telling right now that OPEC must reduce production. Um, and I think even in the very best scenario of all the scenarios we can think of, where China goes through some sort of, I mean, I guess the very best scenario is actually at this point off the table, but let's just for the sake of argument, let's go through this. China had this V-shaped recovery. There was a hit to demand of maybe a quarter and a half or something, and then a, a, a strong rebound on the back of like fiscal stimulus, etc. We would still have too much oil, so they would still have to cut probably like a million barrels a day on top of what they already cut. They, they already did cut twice over the past couple of months. So, let's, let's assume it's not a, um, a V-shaped recovery and it's something worse. I mean, oh. I, they, they say there's a U-shaped recovery. Now, this to me is complete nonsense because really what they're saying is it'll take a little bit longer for us to return to some sort of normality. I mean, this coronavirus, which is really you know, what we've been talking about, um, on top of... Uh, the credit cycle sort of rather suggests that this actually could continue for some time, this, this collapse in demand. So um, presumably you'd see far lower uh, oil prices on that basis and presumably you'd see this, what, shutting down quite a lot of the shale production in America? Yeah, so I mean OPEC in my view has basically, uh, so far they tried, what OPEC saw until recently was okay 2021 will and beyond will be very tight, right? So we don't want to lose um, revenues so we rather cut a little bit if we have to cut a million or so of the 30 plus million we're producing, okay, we have, we lose a little bit of market share, but shale production in the US is already slowing down. And then uh, conventional non-OPEC production is definitely going to decline um, from 2022 onwards. So we just have to go through this relatively short period of a year, maybe two, where we have to keep production offline, but keep prices higher and then we can actually once we going into the tight period from then on we just bring that um, stuff back to the market. This is That's the question is, even if they cut production can they keep prices where they are you know if this becomes a more severe economic crisis. Yeah so now OPEC has a total total different outlook As it, at the moment what they're signaling there there will be a meeting um, on the 5th and 6th of March the Saudis actually were pushing for an emergency meeting mm -hmm. for uh, already when the coronavirus outbreak started to become larger and prices start to collapse Saudi Arabia was pushing for an emergency meeting Meeting, and Russia now being part of OPEC plus pushed back heavily so long that they actually dropped it and they're going to meet during the regular meeting on the 5th and 6th. So Russia actually was quite successful not to have an emergency cut but prices have dropped $15 in the meantime. And so um, now I think they really have to look at this and if they come to the conclusion that there is actually a larger demand impact from this. And let's discuss this in a second, but basically just what their option is right now, they can say, okay, it seems to be inevitable that we're going down to $30 and actually let the shale guys go out of business. Go out of business. And, and, and from a Russian perspective, that's probably the preferable solution anyway, right? If you only had a year to, to bridge and there was not the chance that the shale producers go out of business, okay, then why not keep the price high? But now you actually they have to make the decision, okay, if it's inev inevitable anyway, why should we cut more? Let's speed up the process mm -hmm. and then we're going to end up at $30 anyway and, and the faster the shale producers are shutting in and going bankrupt, the better. So that's, I think that's what we, yeah. we're standing right now. Now, obviously, going back to the original question is, how bad is that demand impact? And if it, it really depends on two things. A, how do government react to this when we see kind of rapid spreading of the virus in some countries? Like, are, we, uh, are the European and the US uh, the Europeans and the US, are they reacting the same way China did? Because China kind of 
wrote the playbook on this. They shut down an entire region. And if you look at the number and believe it, but it seems to be supported by economic activity picking up in China right now. They actually got this under control to some extent, and and the spreading of the virus has slowed down dramatically. Where China actually doesn't add as many cases anymore as other countries do. It's exactly. the numbers. Uh, yeah, and the number of infected people is going down. Um, so, what they have done was uh, was absolutely uh, well unprecedented, but it seems to have worked. Um, and so. Yeah, the Chinese wrote the playbook, and now this is happening in the West, and how are governments going to react? Do they believe we're going to get it in the end anyway? Or actually are they doing the same thing and shutting down entire regions, which may be futile, and then you, you're causing extra economic damage, um, and in the end it's spreading anyway. So it, it, that, it, a lot of it depends on that, because the economic damage really becomes on if nobody travels anymore and supply chains are being impacted more, et cetera, et cetera. And then if governments are not doing anything, well, then companies actually may do something. They may actually shut down plants. We're seeing this right now, for instance, in South Korea, where um, off the top of my head, I think it was uh, Hyundai, they had like one case and then they shut down the entire plant. Yep. So you can see these kind of things. And that's basically what we're seeing right now in Switzerland and other parts of Europe is that companies really thinking about extended home office periods for a large part of their staff, um, canceling all travel. I mean, that must impact economic growth to some extent as well, not just fuel trans uh, transportation fuel demand. It's already tipping into recession. And Germany is already in recession. Yes. Um, so it's already, you know, this is on top of what was, was already happening and it could really be quite severe. I, I, I think so too. I mean, as I mentioned before, if you look at the oil numbers, even before the Corona uh, virus outbreak started to become media headlines, we actually saw oil demand growth to be very, very weak in the second half of 19. So for me, not all GDP growth hits are equal. If you have a GDP growth hit of 2% on growth of 4 that's okay. But if you have a GDP growth hit on growth of 2%, then you have a cascading effect. Companies shutting down, going bankrupt, laying off people, people not consuming, and so on and so forth. And then eventually, and I think we're going to talk about, it, about this later, but right now we have a health crisis that quickly could become an economic crisis and then eventually could become a financial crisis yeah. again. Yes, I mean, broadening out from energy, I, um, you're, you're right about this threatening to be a spreading crisis. I mean, apart from anything else, the vast bulk of uh, pharmaceutical products in the West are all made in China and their factories have shut down and they need them for themselves. So when it hits us, presumably we're going to have a bit of a problem in that sense. And I think this is particularly important in the case of America because America, uh, President Trump cut uh, the funding for the CDC, which is the Control of D Disease Commission. C Center for Disease Control. Yeah, Center for Disease Control, Thank, thanks Roy. Um, he cut it by something like 9% last fiscal year and he tried to cut it by 16, 17%, something like that the current year. I think some cuts went through, but the result of that is that of the 100 testing centers or centers which are meant to be able to test for um, uh, these diseases, only three of them apparently actually have testing facilities for, for coronavirus. Now, this is very serious. It means that the reason that we're not seeing uh, very many numbers in the United States is simply they're not testing people. So um, this is you know, rolling into a problem. And I think that we've seen, I mean, on, on, on your figures, the reduction in terms of energy demand, which I think we can take as, as proxy for reduction of demand of almost everything else. Um, well, the trading uh, is a multipl multiplier effect on uh, it. In many cases, absolutely. I mean, to, to, to drop from 13, what does it say, do you say? About 13 million. 13 million down I mean, a lot of it is, is um, for instance, Jet fuel demand is mm. absolutely is is crashing, right? Yes. But we, um, I mean, all the figures we have seen um, out of China is that rail transportation, like passengers yeah. on rail, has has collapsed yeah. completely, and even uh, vehicle transportation is down dramatically. Mm. So you look at, for instance, TomTom, uh, 
uh, they basically you, there's, that their data is publicly available yeah. um, in a in a um, anonymous form, so you can actually look at how much congestion there is in everywhere that, where people have tom-toms, yeah. um, and and it has been it's down dramatically. I mean, we talk about in some regions in Wuhan, it's barely existable. People are just not in the streets anymore, but it's down in places where we don't have many, um, many cases like Beijing and Shanghai. Um, so I'm not sure whether China is exactly the blueprint for the rest of the world, but we cannot assume that the rest of the world just goes on. I mean, that, that is yeah. just not going to happen. So that's what I'm saying, that V-shaped recovery in China and then everything is fine, that, that, that is not going mm -hmm. to happen. The, the question is simply how bad it's going to be, right? And, and how bad it's going to be is, um, is really how do governments react? And I'm saying, also I would like to, to highlight this, um, how bad it's going to be, I don't mean this in terms of how much of a health crisis is this going to be? I, I'm not an expert on this. N none of us is. No. So we don't. We really don't know how bad this is going to be. There is many, many scenarios that could be. There's a lot of unknown unknowns. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this could be. Maybe we find out that the mortality rate is a lot lower than what is currently in the media, and and it's maybe not so bad. Or maybe there is an, a scenario which some health experts say that when this drags on into the summer, the, in the hot weather, it is actually spreading less. And maybe the virus is mutating. It becomes. Uh, there's a lot of. See, what I'm talking about is strictly in terms of what the economic damage um, this is doing. Yeah. Um, and there, really, it's a combination of what governments are doing, um, what companies are doing, and then how individuals are behaving. I mean, even if governments completely let this go and say we don't do anything, um, everybody's going to be infected in the end anyway. Let's just get over with it people will still react to this, right? People will travel yeah. less, like air travel will be dramatically down, at least in the beginning of, yeah. of this. And I can't imagine public transport being much different either. Um, so moving on slightly, um, Roy, you've got very much uh, a trader's nose, if I can say that, for what's going on in markets. And um, I should say that this last week, we have seen th three 1,000 pound point falls in Wall Street. I mean, it really has been a change in sentiment. It's just switched like that. Everybody is, is blaming coronavirus, which is entirely understandable. But from your um, observation, what's going on in markets, how do you, how do you feel things are, are developing now in these early days of 2020? So I think that the market wanted to crash even before the coronavirus hit us. Uh, I think it was setting up for, for a crash uh, for the last few weeks. And I think just if you look at the, the level of retail, retail trading uh, and the ownership of some of the names that caused the S&P 500 to rise, the tenor of decline from the coronavirus scare coupled with sort of the reflexivity of everyone trying to rush out at the same time has been surprising. It surprised me even how quickly the market dropped. So naturally, having uh, that contrarian and trader instinct, um, I'm actually less bearish on the market uh, going into this weekend because I see that the volatility index uh, was at 49 until the last six minutes of Friday's session. Last six minutes dropped from 49 to 40. This is the VIX. The VIX. Yeah. So the VIX being that high, um, you know, even if coronavirus spreads. And, and so I, I agree with Stefan in, in the way that we can't handicap the unknowns and unknown unknowns. But what we can do is we can look at a few scenarios in terms of how this will affect aggregate demand. Um, and I think that the V-shaped recovery, there's no, no, no question. It, it would have already happened. v shape means, I mean, we're already two months yeah. into this thing. So it's not a V-shape. Um, it could be a U-shape. But I think that the, the greater question here that everyone has to ask themselves is whether the coronavirus is, a, is another symptom in central banks losing their potency to affect markets. You mean in the sense of their response? Their response. Mm -hmm. so, so they're entirely impotent to respond to a virus. They're entirely impotent to respond to uh, any decline in real cooperative activity between people that comes about for social, cultural reasons. 
And what's worse about this is their entire monetary transmission mechanism, the, the method through which they debase the money, it can't even plug the hole in a working capital balance sheet fast enough. So if American Airlines, uh, which has a working capital of you know, a few billion dollars and is completely dependent on selling this many plane tickets for the flow of revenue that comes in, all of a sudden sees a, a drop in 20 or 30 percent revenue, there's no way, even if the Fed printed trillions of dollars tomorrow, that American Airlines would, would receive that. The, the value of, the, of their debt, of their cost of borrowing would decline, but that doesn't, that doesn't have any impact on the flow of revenue coming in. So we haven't seen uh, aggregate demand fall off a cliff like this in a long time. And when you start to incorporate all the reflexive aspects, uh, I, I really am interested in this idea that if oil keeps dropping, um, at some point the uh, producers of oil will no longer be the marginal buyer of these foreign, foreign dollar assets. I mean, wow, if that happens, that could be a total disaster. So I think that the market itself uh, it, it shouldn't keep declining at the rate that it's been declining because that's not sustainable. There's uh, an extraordinary amount of unsustainable fear and panic that will revert to a mean. But I definitely think the equity markets will be lower a year from now mm. than where they are. Uh, and I think that the bigger question now facing uh, economists and also uh, political uh, commentators is how all of this and the idea that central banks are no longer uh, capable of supporting uh, both the markets and political ideas, how will all of this affect the next election cycle in the United States? That's a very interesting question. I don't know. Can I just add a point to, uh, to Roy's here about equity markets being lower a year from now? You're assuming that the demand for fiat currency that national governments produce will continue to be there. Um, in my mind, I'm sort of wondering, you know, what the impact is going to be on national currencies, because as Stefan alluded to, um, we have a health crisis which is turning into an economic crisis, which could turn into a financial or banking crisis. If we have a banking crisis, what is the impact of that going to be? Are people going to be lining up like they did for Northern Rock and starting pulling money out of the banking system? And if so, is the central bank, are the central banks going to be printing? Because if the central banks are printing wildly in order to try to fight this, you could actually have equity markets higher in nominal dollar terms or nominal currency terms, but of course down in real purchasing power terms, which I think is the important point you're making. It's, it's all about timing in it's, my view. Yeah, yeah so, and I, I understand this argument uh, that you have, and you've been right about that for many years. But if you recall, when we had these conversations privately, I, I told you the market will crash at some point. And the market always has a way of surprising us and always has a way of punishing the most amount of people. Uh, and so I don't see it. I, I really think that central bankers, th even if they decide to debase money again, whether it's as a backstop to the financial system with some of the tools they've developed post-crisis, I don't see that money flowing back into equity markets for a very long time in the way that it flowed recently. Because what you've had is a complete destruction of savings over the last two weeks for the average retail investor, they won't return to markets, yeah. and you're gonna to start to see pension funds, asset managers having to take risk off. And like I said, I think the aggregate demand question is, is the biggest one. If, if people see, if corporations see a decline in revenue as a result of this, even if it's 30 days long, it will destroy the next six months of profitability, and you're gonna see a distress cycle. So, so my ears perk up as a former distressed investor when I see so many balance sheets stretched the way they are, induced by s central bankers to issue debt at low borrowing costs and purchase stock, repurchase stock. That combination of issuing debt to repurchase stock to game your EPS numbers, that's going to punish many, many companies. I can see Carnival Cruise Lines, American Airlines, even a company like Ford. These are companies that can't survive if, if their demand for products declines for four or five weeks. They cannot survive. So you'll have a distress cycle and borrowing costs will, will rise. I, I just think the equity game is over. It doesn't mean the equity markets can't rise again. I just think 
there was something fundamental, even statistically, I, I don't enjoy quoting statistics normally, but statistically the, the, the rate of decline in the S&P 500 was in terms of how the percentage rate of decline over, over six days, it's only happened three times in the last 90 years. So if the central banks do start printing and there is a flow of money, where is that flow going to go? You're saying it's going to go into government paper? Well, I think, I think it's going to have to go into um, trying to plug this demand gap. That's the only way they can stop it. They, they can't stop it by just supporting asset prices this time. So it has to almost be like a helicopter money, yeah. or, 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 or let's look at Hong Kong. Yeah, so Hong Kong just did this mm. you know, uh, $1,200 per citizen stimulus. That's the right approach. Th this almost has to be a fiscal stimulus. It has to be some kind of a fiscal stimulus. I, I remember when George Bush did the iPod stimulus where he gave everyone, uh, what was it, $800 or something? Yeah. Uh, there needs to be something like that where you're depositing the, the newly uh, printed money or you're incurring debt at the treasury level directly into people's bank accounts, kind of like as a disaster relief. Um, I don't think this is a central banker issue. And I also, though this is a little more speculative, I also believe that the central bankers uh, don't want to re-elect Trump. And so I think that they are not going to pull out all stops uh, in, in, in terms of extraordinary policy. They'll keep the system running smoothly. They're not going to allow the banking system to collapse. They can always supply liquidity in that sense, just like they do with a repo. But in terms of how they achieve their dual mandate, I think you're more likely to see a fiscal stimulus than central banks uh, just printing money because they realize that they're pushing on a string. They, they can't achieve a, a decline in aggregate demand, a rapid shock to aggregate demand, something we haven't seen in a very long time. And it's something the Fed can cure, can't cure. Mm. There's many good things here, and if I may, I may add some. I think what ultimately probably would have to happen is to, to have some sort of helicopter money with an expiry date so that people actually have to go and spend it. <laughs> because otherwise they will just take the check and clear some debt or something. You mean like a negative yielding bond? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, like let's, let's assume like yeah, a, let's, let's, say, let's assume a prepay card yeah, that can be loaded with money and you have to spend it in 30 days or the money is going away. Something like that, exactly. right? So, so now that's that's my, my question, my, I'm actually, it's kind of shocking that Hong Kong is doing this kind of stuff already so early on in this crisis, right? Because in my view is at the moment, even if the Fed wanted to, there's not that much they can do, right? So they can, okay, they can slash interest rates, which they're going to do, and they do some more QE, but they can't go the next step until there's a real pain level there. And when that real pain level is there, I think stocks are already a lot lower. So, so the point I'm making is the next inflation cycle is in the things you need not in the things you own. Yeah. So when they inject money directly into the system, the prepaid card idea is one that I've heard central bankers throwing around before. So I think they might do that. And by the way, they already have a system for the United States called the EBT card. That's, that's how they do it. You, you get this card and the treasury deposits money every month. So they could just send everyone one of those cards. But you're gonna see inflation in, uh, in the things that you need, in energy, in food, commodities. And, and commodities. Yeah. And so if anything, that would hit margins uh, and labor costs for a public companies even more. So EPS would be impacted at least for the next year or two. Uh, valuations are meaningless. Valuations if, are meaningless. If, if, if EPS is negative in any way, then it, it doesn't matter how much stimulus you get from central banks, right? So if, if companies are like just burning money, then, yeah. then I mean, that's it. Do. We're not sure about this yet. Yeah, yeah no, we, absolutely we, not. We, we need to see guidance all we've seen so far is guidance from Apple saying they weren't going to make their quarter. We've started to see guidance from some more companies saying, like the, the one that was the most interesting to me actually is MasterCard. They came out with guidance saying that they weren't going to make their quarter, which is surprising because it's telling you the velocity of money is declining. So people are not using their MasterCards as fast because it's interchange revenue. So that one is surprising. But the next two weeks will really tell us if this demand shock is real or not, and Stefan's absolutely right. If uh, if corporations and governments approach this the way that China did, see, in a way, we see Trump's genius yet again. Uh, it's so easy to criticize him 
for the way he's approached the coronavirus, uh, which is what most people are doing. But if he turns out to be right and this thing fizzles out, uh, his approach towards this was the right approach. And, and I understand you know, the arguments of Nassim Taleb and others that when something just happens, you have to panic and you have to uh, look out for yourself. But we, we don't yet know if this is real. If, if it continues to spread and governments and corporations react in an, in, a, in an aggressive way, there will be a demand shock. It will affect aggregate demand. Corporations will be losing money and any monetary stimulus will have to be injected directly to the people causing inflation. If this thing fizzles out, then I also think I know how it plays out. If, even if this thing fizzles out, the central bank goes back to the old narrative where it's stuck between a rock and a hard place. It cannot keep debasing money because there's political upheaval. There's political upheaval in the world and, and their, 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 their debasement of money is not achieving anything. And so I think th either way, the environment is great for gold and, and it's, a, it's a great environment uh, to, be, to not be investing in equities, that's for sure. Maybe, right. so, what may, was, may I add one last thing, what you said, and, and um, I wanted to come back on that. I agree with you that the Fed is not particularly keen on having Trump re-elected. And I think that was the play. But now all of a sudden you see the alternative and there is a substantial chance that Bernie Sanders is actually taking Democratic nomination. And I'm not sure whether the central bank is so keen on having Bernie Sanders as the next president. So they're really like in a difficult situation here. That, that's one thing. But building on that, it really shows where this whole thing has brought us. It's basically the choice uh, for the next US president is either of two populist camps. Um, and I think that is a direct, um, that is directly caused, um, or to, at least to some extent, of um, our financial system over the past, I would say, decades. Yeah. Uh, moving on from the American scene, which I, you know, I, th I think we've sort of got to the unknown <laughs> knowns or unknown unknowns. Um, one thing that interests me, Godfrey, is. Do you think that the ECB has any room to deal with this sort of crisis? I mean, they've got interest rates way down. If you're going to sort of helicopter money or whatever, I mean, aren't the banks so overgeared in terms of um, their balance sheets relative to their capital and so on? I mean, it, what's your sense of it from your Can opinion? I just point add to that, particularly the Italian banks, which are, you know, the economy is now you know, suffering because yep. of the problems in northern Italy. And therefore, the Italian banks are perhaps the most vulnerable. And they, and, and they start with a very high level of non-performing debt yes. as well. Yes, I mean, the, the, the European Central Bank has been buying uh, Italian sovereign debt now for several years. Mm. Uh, and I actually spoke to Draghi on this when he was actually bailing out the Spanish. Uh, and I said, you know, he was saying, you know, don't worry, we're going to do whatever it takes and we can do this and the other. And uh, I said, well... <clears throat> You know, it's limitless, isn't it? You're going to have a, you're forking out for the Spanish, going to fork out for the Italians. You're going to be buying, uh, you're buying government, you're buying what was sovereign debt to the tune of 60 billion or so um, euros a month, uh, and that's and that's gone up. And then he said, oh well, I'm you know, it's, it, he was talking about it being asset backed, but he doesn't. But if you look at the numbers, they're buying things like uh, Volkswagen Finance and BMW Finance. So the money. <laughs> what he's doing is he's buying your next door neighbor's son's secondhand BMW. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. Um, <clears throat> they've got nowhere to run. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, they've got nowhere to go. They've already done it. They've been doing it quietly <clears throat> um, because nobody wants to bubble it. But this is how the European Union and the ECB works, because they don't publish their minutes. It's not an open thing, the ECB. It's all in secret. But of course, they have, they, they've been buying this uh, junk. They've been buying junk uh, ever since they bought the last lot of junk. Uh, so uh, buying, nothing changed. And this is a reason I, I used to get cross in the chamber. Nothing's changed. 2000 and t 2008, uh, all they did, they didn't change anything. Uh, they didn't say, right, let's get rid of this or let's get rid 
of fractional reserve banking or let's bring something in here, let's do all this kind of thing. They didn't do any of that. Uh, so the status quo, and the difference is, the only difference is between 2007, 8 and now, uh, you just triple all the numbers. Uh, so no, they've got absolutely nowhere to run to. They don't know what they're doing. They're all completely crackers. Uh, the uh, bureaucracy have never, don't understand money, but then nobody does. We just had a Bank of England governor who had no idea what money was at all, yeah, Mark sorry, Garvey. The worst. Amateur night. Yeah. Uh, they're all Keynesian. They all went to places like this. Beautiful Oxford. It's absolutely marvellous, but they've got no idea about economics. Uh, and so consequently, you've got, it's amateur night on the bridge of the ship. And sooner or later, we'll hit the iceberg. And I honestly don't think there's the slightest thing that can be done about it. I have to be yeah. terribly pessimistic. The die is cast. Uh, it has to get a lot worse before it gets better. And the funny thing is, I don't think anybody will have learnt any lessons. There'll be no chancellors, ex-chancellors, bureaucrats, bankers who will have learnt a thing from this crisis. They just think that they perhaps didn't do enough. Last yeah, of the of, of yeah. the wrong things, they should have done more like, like the sort of seventeenth century doctors who would put leeches on anemic pregnant women, they, and they died. Of course, they would die, wouldn't they? And the doctors thought they didn't put enough leeches on them, uh, and that's the kind of reaction you're going to get. Right. Well, I don't think we can add very much to that. I and mean, presumably, Japan is in the same sort of situation with negative interest rates. I mean, where I mean, for a start. Managing, trying to manage the level of interest rates achieves absolutely nothing. But if you push interest rates into negative territory, then actually you're distorting things so much that you're going to bring about a crisis sooner or later. Uh, yes, I mean, you can't, you, can't, uh, you can't live with bankrupt governments suggesting that you should give them th your money and they will give you by definition, less money than you give them to start with yeah. in 10 years' time. I mean, the, again, the problem is its yield. And of course, a lot of the pension schemes, and they, uh, a lot of that is based on yield. And they're not buying bonds. You can't buy bonds. Well, what's so farcical about this now is one arm of the government has an inflation target of 2% and the other arm is issuing a bond at a negative yield. Exactly. <laughs> and, so, yeah. and of course, lending these, uh, you know, with, with, with governments lending their central banks and central banks buying government debt, you know, I always say this, that it's a bit like Robinson Crusoe being washed up on an island mm. uh, and there's no food. So he has a wonderful idea, he eats his own leg, uh, <laughs> and which is fine, it satiates his hunger for a few days and then he's got another leg to eat. Well, that's two, then he gets through a whole week, maybe even two weeks, but then he's got no legs. All they're doing Doing is feeding on themselves. You know, they're soaring off their own legs, eating their own legs. Can't go on for much longer. I'm surprised it's gone on as long as this. Well, 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 well I have a counter uh, theory for why it might be able to go on uh, for longer. So, so there's just two aspects to this. The first is that the invisible hand is predict predicting a rapid decline in population. And I've been saying this for a few years. And I, I originally was saying it based on uh, so socioeconomic trends that I was seeing, even with younger people and millennials, household formation rates in the West, decline in fertility rates. But um, I also think that um, it, 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 can't, it, it, it may also have to do with a change in the political landscape, in the sense that for the last 40 or 50 years, the politicians were doing exactly what you're saying. Same, more of the same, double it, and just get elected. But this time, the type of people that may get elected in the West will fundamentally transform the relationship between capital and labor. And so in, in that scenario, we might have a round of monetary debasement that feeds more into labor than capital, like if a Bernie Sanders wins the election. But all things equal, assuming that uh, we continue on the, on the same trajectory we've been going, I think you might see population numbers decline significantly in 30 or 40 years. Uh, no way reaching the UN estimates and perhaps even staying where they are or down 10 or 20 percent from where they are 30 years from now. And in that scenario, a negative yielding bond makes sense if you, if you think about it. It, it takes a, li a little bit of uh, c conceptualization, but essentially you have less people being born than are dying. And so the money that's circulating, even though it's self-deleting, uh, the people that are, that are meritorious are earning that share from the people that are not. So it's, it's almost a way to, to plug the problem. Now, the, the other question one could ask is, they caused this. In other words, it, w it was their action that is literally 
you know, cause society to, to not want to keep growing and form households and, and also destroy our ecology in many ways, not in the sense of climate change, but in the sense of wasting energy per capita in, in ways we've never seen before. So overall, I, I agree with what you're saying, but it may be that these negative, because in the United States, negative yields may now end up going to 3% or 4%. It's, it's, you know, it, 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 it doesn't require... Yeah, that the, would put the whole of the commodity complex into severe backwardation, which, which I can think of nothing that would collapse the purchasing power of the dollar more quickly. But what if you have a decline in population at a rate of 3% a year? Well, coronavirus might well do that for them. But anyway, the other problem actually in this is that uh, the US government's costs will not be going down. They will continue to be going up, whatever the level of the population. Nominally. I would agree, I'd certainly agree with you nominally, yes. And um, which really means we're looking at a purchasing power of the dollar going down effectively. And it's not just the US government costs. I mean, Germany now is. Uh, talking about bringing extraordinary measures and getting rid of the temporary debt ceiling, or getting rid of the debt ceiling in the constitu uh, con Constitution on a temporary basis. When I hear the word temporary, I'm thinking of <laughs> President Nixon in 1971 yeah. temporarily suspending the link between dollar and gold. Yeah, I, always, so, I, always, I always take, if I'm, uh, if I'm talking to undergraduates at, uh, at various universities on the principle of you know, Austrian school economics and gold in particular, I always carry, it happens to be a 1908 sovereign for some reason, it's not a particularly significant date, it happens to have 1908 on it. Uh, and I always say the same thing to them. Uh, this coin, which was the equivalent of a pound coin, if you will, in 1908, this particular coin will buy you today pretty much what it would have bought you in 1908, which is bed, breakfast and dinner, and that will buy you that today. This is the situation. So I would say, uh, even if I accepted your hypothesis, which is very well presented, I have to say, I'm, I'll buy your used car, um, it's an interesting hypothesis, uh, but I would sooner that there's just a bigger case for gold because oh, for it's, sure, it, yeah. it, the purchasing it's, power it's of gold, of how, yeah. how yeah. many people on the planet, that 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 gold piece in in and it's about wealth preservation, isn't it? That we're all really talking about. If we're gold bugs, we're talking about wealth preservation uh, uh, for people who have made their money, who have got their money, who saved their money, who have another sort of ten or fifteen years on the planet, and they want to hand something on to their children. It's wealth preservation, and I can't see. And I would say this, wouldn't I? Because I'm your guest. I'm a guest of gold money. There is simply no alternative that I can see other than gold. I can't think of any commodity. It's been money for 5,000 years. There is nowhere else to go uh, except gold in specie. Absolutely. I think um, on, that, on that note, uh, we haven't heard from James at all. Can I just sort of start, off, start you off with something that the IMF said the other day? They reckoned that the coronavirus would reduce global economic growth by 0.1% from their previous estimate. Comments, please. Well, we're in this environment, <laughs> inflate or die. Yes. Uh, the central banks have one answer for everything, which is just print more money. And it's not sustainable in the long run. It's gone on a lot longer than I thought was possible. You know, my book, uh, The Coming Collapse of the Dollar in 2004, thought, you know, maybe 2008 was going to be it. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, it, they managed to pump up the system a little bit longer and kept it going a little bit longer. But I'm at the point now where I'm thinking, that is this finally, you know, the, the big issue? Because we've got so many forces coming to bear at the same time. Uh, we've got this huge debt load, which is twice what it was in 2008. We've got these political forces impacting around the world. We've got central banks now being recognized that th this is, you could either call it a tool of the political elite, or if you're at the uh, suffering from financial repression, artificially low interest rates, or some of these other things, you could say it's a weapon of the political elite. Elite, So you've got all of these forces coming together and I'm just wondering, like I was mentioning in that first section, whether we're going to see something more fundamental now. Uh, because every once in a while, you know, we evolve, but there is a lockstep uh, function that occurs periodically. And I'm just wondering whether we're at one of those stages where you're going to see some kind of lockstep function occurring. And if that's true, 
I echo what you're saying, that you have to go back to what we know. And what we know is that gold has been around for 5,000 years as a means of preserving purchasing power. Because remember, the purchasing power is already created. It's already out there. It's being held in the form of fiat currency. And you hope that that purchasing power is going to be there when you're ready to spend that fiat currency. And what happens when the gold price rises is that purchasing power is moving from the people who are holding fiat currency to the people who are holding gold. It's not actually really creating wealth in the true macro sense. It's just moving that wealth around to, you know, as they say in the markets, where the smart money is. And the smart money is where the undervalued asset is appreciating in value. So I really see gold as the answer going forward, which I guess is not too surprising for me, <laughs> you know, given my background. No, but, I think, I mean, um, Obviously, it's not too surprising from all of us, but I th what we try and do is try and base um, our opinions on where gold may go on solid economic reasoning. Um, and if I may give you my views on this, um, I've already mentioned that uh, I see uh, the combination uh, today that we had in 1929, which, if I'm right, is very dangerous, even without um, this virus, uh, we are looking at conditions that are likely to lead to a very deep slump. Um, and the deeper the slump, the faster the rate of money printing is likely to occur because they cannot afford to do anything else. No, no one can stop. I mean, I, I have some sympathy with the position of Havenstein back in in uh, Germany in 1923. Um, he just said a few very stupid things, but basically he was locked into a situation which he couldn't deal just with. Like the central bankers today are exactly locked into the, the same, same thing. thing. Well, I have an answer exactly the same. about this. I recently met Jean-Claude Truchet and we spoke uh, for the greater part of, of the evening and had a great conversation. That was basically what he told me. He told me he had no choice. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And he was quite if I may say, a fan of gold. Mm. And, uh, I asked him actually in, in Parliament, um, just on his retirement day virtually, it was almost the day he came to sort of say goodbye, and I was, because I was on the committee, could ask him a question, and I said, may I ask you, Mr. President, is, is, uh, is your pension in euros or gold? <laughs> and he gave me a very wry smile. He didn't answer. Really? I think it's on camera somewhere, yeah. We're, and we all laughed, yeah. Can I, can I just say, though, if you had asked someone like Karl Adapul or any of the other um, governors of the Bundesbank what the uh, answer was, they said they would have a choice. They're not going to print. Uh, and, the, and the Bundesbank did that for many, many years up until, you know, they be decided to join the EU. And also when central bank governors in the Reichsbank no longer had, or of the Bundesbank no longer had the memory of what happened uh, in terms of the monetary debasement after the Second World War. So what I'm saying is that Trichet was an instrument of the political establishment. That's what central banks have come. The, that's not the traditional role of central banks. The exactly. traditional solo tr uh, uh, role of central banks is they were independent from the political establishment, particularly under the gold standard, but even under the fiat currency standard, as we saw with the Bundesbank in Germany from uh, 1950 until, say, 1988, 1985. Um, coming back to, to um, I think, what is the most visible danger to me is the overvaluation of the bond markets. Um, officially, inflation everywhere is 2%. And this is almost as if uh, the CPI formula is constructed in such a way that with a little bit of fiddling around, you can gold seek 2%. Um, <laughs> well, that's exactly what it is. Which is exactly what it is. But if you look at the, I mean, the only independent numbers I can find are American. You've got shadowstats.com and MIT you've got- project. Sorry? The MIT project, thousand yeah, uh, prices. That's not one I, I know of. The other one I know of is Chapwood. Okay, anyway, yeah. I'll have to look that one up. But both of those confirm each other, and they reckon that the rate of price inflation in America is in the region of 10% and has been for some time. And certainly, I think, uh, because you can't, you, you can't actually measure the rate of uh, price inflation. It is a concept. It's an economic concept which just simply cannot be measured, which, of course, gives you the latitude to say whatever you want. And this is effectively the world in which we're living. The investment community accepts that it's 2%, even though all of us know that the cost of living has risen more like 
the rates um, revealed by shadow stats and um, by uh, the Chapwood Index. So let us assume, and this is an assumption, I admit, but I think it is becoming very, very likely, the central banks lose control over pricing and it goes back to markets. Now, the reason I think this is very likely this time, which is coming back to your, you know, your point that this is the time when it could well all fall over. And Roy's point about rising commodity prices. Rising, yeah, all that, all that feeds in, but it feeds in, 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 in a sequence. I think the commodity prices are maybe a little bit down the road, but in terms of time, not, not very far. Um, what, I, what, what I see is that there will be a time when markets begin to take over the pricing of financial assets. That being the case, I would argue that with a 10% rate of inflation, plus something for time preference, a 10-year US Treasury should yield at least 10%, which puts the price around about 47, 47% of par, if you like. Now, just imagine what that would do to the equity markets. Um, I mean, this is not going to happen overnight, but you could see that- I don't think it happens ever. Financial, well, it, it can't happen with the way that they control the economy. I think what you get is something different where it flows into that individual. So the individual wakes up in the morning and gets fed up with the real world inflation and the individual's liberty is now being impaired and they vote in a really, really crazy way. So they try Trump, but they see that it hasn't changed. So this time they vote for Bernie. And, and then you don't even have, you have a, a speculation think, tax on Wall Street. You have all these. Yeah, but this is what they're fighting too. They're fighting that. the gravity yeah, of this, for sure. Because if interest rates went to that level, the U.S. government would be spending, instead of 15% of its in budget on interest expense, exactly. they'd be spending 50%, they're which in means in. they'd have an even bigger deficit exactly. going into a massive hyperinflation. And uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff reckons that, and I was talking to someone the other day who had him on an interview, and um, he was reckoning that the net present value of uh, future liabilities in the order of $250 trillion. So, and this is coming down the pipe. And um, it comes down the pipe a lot more quickly when you have a problem like the virus, like unemployment suddenly starts rising because businesses start, well, businesses start going out of business, laying people off, whatever. Um, it's, I think we have reached the point where the overvaluation in the bond market is now so acute, it cannot be sustained for very much longer. Now, if I'm right in that, then this brings me into another hypothesis, and that is um, the situation that John Law found himself in exactly 300 years ago, where basically what he did was he um, set up a bank with the agreement of the Prince Regent, and that was then turned into, um, if you like, a central bank. It was the Banque Royale. It went from Banque Générale to Banque Royale. And at the same time, he had managed to gain for himself a monopoly on France's overseas trade, which was wrapped up in what we today call the Mississippi Company. He used the ability to print money from his own bank to ramp up the shares in the Mississippi venture. And he did that so effectively that, um, particularly by uh, um, giving all his chums uh, shares, or saying you can subscribe for shares on a partly paid basis. The payments won't come, you know, the payment on the rest won't come due whenever. So people were putting in sort of, you know, all their money into these shares on a partly paid basis. The shares doubled, but because they were 5% paid, you know, they were making 20 times their money. The inflation that he generated on the back of that began to undermine the purchasing power of his own livre, because there were now so many of them out there, uh, by the end of uh, 1719, that by the time he did the merger, which was in, in, on the 28th of February 1720, the whole thing had begun to stall. The purchasing power of the livre was going down, and when the king chose to sell 100,000 shares of the joint bank Mississippi Venture at 9,000 shares each, payable in payments, in, in, in installments. Um, that was just too much for the market. Now, by the end of that year, now we're, we're talking about Keynesian, Keynesianism on steroids, but we've had Keynesianism for an awful long time. They only had it for about five years. So we've actually got a very similar situation. So what concerns me is that we have now reached that point where Foreigners own all the U.S. dollars. As I said um, earlier on, I think before this meeting, um, uh, the figures suggest it's around about 
24.5 to $25 trillion owned by foreigners. They own an awful lot of securities and debt, and they've probably got around about, I think the figure I last saw was, was including CDs, admittedly, about $5 trillion uh, of um, uh, short-term paper, I mean, I'm talking less than a year, and uh, bank deposits in dollars in the banking system. So the dollar is over -owned. But what we're being told by anyone is, of course, in a crisis, the foreigners will rush into dollars. They've already got the dollars. So you've got a source of selling there, which I think could begin to undermine the currency and at the same time undermine the financial assets. It is actually a dead ringer for what we saw with John Law in 1720. Now, here's the worrying thing. This started off, as far as John Law was concerned, the crisis really started just before he merged those two companies, the, his, his, his central bank with um, uh, you know, his, his share puffery. And um, by the end of that year, I think by September uh, 1720, the Banque Royale shares, um, Mississippi shares, were worth something like two to 3,000 uh, livres each. But the livre was worthless. So the shares were effectively worthless as well. Now, it took just a year for that to fall apart. Now, just think, things are now become so extreme in terms of this combination of using the printing of money to puff up asset prices to ensure that the price of US Treasury bonds are twice what they should be, and the same in every other bond market, and negative yields in, your, in the Euro, uh, Eurozone, and also negative yields in, in uh, uh, Japan, you can see that we actually have a dead ringer for what John Law did. And this could actually fall apart very, very quickly. Once it starts sliding, it's under nobody's control. Yeah, like 15% in six days. Well, that was just, you know, just a little bit of grape shot, I think. Mm. That's why for, for yeah. me in 2020, I think the watchword is safety. Mm. That's the way I view it. I mean, even with last week's uh, um, decline in precious metal prices, you know, gold is still up 3% year to date which is pretty respectable. But aside from whether you're actually you know, gaining or, or losing, when you own physical gold, you have something that's tangible. It's not subject to anybody's counterparty risk. Uh, and you know it's money that you own. It's purchasing power that's stored in that gold that you can use at some point in time in the future. It always has a value. It always has a value. And I think a lot of people forget this. It has a value. So if you have... Uh, if you have a bond, a collapsed bond or an equity, it can actually go to zero, uh, yeah. as it did in the days of John Law. Um, yes, it, uh, where gold is have a value, it, even if gold took a fairly heavy bath in this scenario, the, the disaster scenario. Well, it's only relative to everything else. It yeah. would still have a value and you'd still be better off. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the other thing is uh, interesting, at that particular time, a year later, the Parisian police knocked on every single door to confiscate any gold holdings. They were digging up people's back gardens and all sorts of but, things. Uh, if you have one gram of gold today, you'll have one gram of gold in 100 years, 1,000 yeah. years, 5,000 yeah. years. And do not confuse it. That trick. The future or a forward contract. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no from, one... from a, a bank that yes. they'll have the gold when you call for it. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, no. exactly. So <laughs> no one watching should be buying uh, yeah. precious metals unless they're buying physical, uh, preferably in their hand uh, or on their wrist, or uh, if not, then through a service like Gold Money where we actually maintain physical vaults uh, around the world with insurance and where you own a physical weight of gold outside the banking system. But it turns out that just that, that simple trick of having one thing retain its weight over time is something that nothing else can achieve, uh, whether it's an incorporeal instrument or even something corporeal. And that's what makes gold money. It's, it's the natural attributes that uh, it's endowed with. I think we've reached the point where we've um, just about flogged that to death. We've got um, some questions which uh, some gold money customers have sent in. And uh, I'd just like to wrap up with maybe your answers to just a few of those. Um, I'm going to start with this one. How could a country with low gold reserves relative to the size of the economy, such as Britain, maintain the currency's purchasing power in a currency crisis? Does it simply mean that the pound will become a weak currency, much like the Thai baht? Who would like to take that one? You don't need gold reserves in a country to um, 
accumulate gold. Um, you accumulate money from the application of labor and, and you know, hard work yeah, and, and creating you know, goods and services, exporting business yeah. and using the, the surplus that you're generating from your productive efforts and in putting it into something. You can put that into gold, regardless where the gold is mined. Perhaps there might be a, a, an option here. Um, almost echoes of the Renton mark in the in the in the in, in, in German history, and that is one thing that they they've got rid of their gold stupidly. Okay, fair enough, but there is an awful lot of government real estate, uh, which you know they hang on to, they don't need, uh, and so they could perhaps start looking at a, a at a currency which is asset backed in some form. Uh, not enough gold, they don't have enough gold to do that at, at, at the moment, although it isn't necessarily, it could be part uh, real estate, it could be part gold, it could be in some form an asset backed. But if they come, but it's not just this country, I mean any country that goes on thinking you can get away with printing worthless paper is, go, is doomed to failure sooner but or later. Are, are, you, are you not, uh, Godfrey, sort of um, suggesting that something like uh, the backing for the French Assignat... Yeah, that's what um, I was thinking of the Assignat, <laughs> yeah, which was a terrible experiment. Ah, yeah. yes, <laughs> indeed it was, because they still made the mistake of printing they it printed again. It, yeah, they yeah. went on printing it. Now, you yeah. can't do that. Oh, I'm not suggesting... It. Yeah, it's okay. got to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. It has okay. to be fixed, yes. I, okay. I still think... I have a different way of answering that question, mm. though. Um, I don't agree that England doesn't have gold. Think about the Bank of England. There's a lot of gold there. It's physically in what, England. We, we nick it off the other central banks. <laughs> That's what, to the victor go the spoils. So there is so that's, much gold in England. That's very interesting. There's $2 dare, trillion. Dollars. Dare, dare I say that's, that's an American uh, <laughs> Fed approach to things. Well, so I wouldn't be so I sure. I have already done it in parts, actually, but yeah, there we Charles are. Charles II was the last one to nick the gold from the tower. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's going oh, to so happen So it's anytime. got people previous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles got, II was the last one. Yeah, we got the previous. Well, you remember when Trump uh, was running for office, he said, we've got to take the oil, take the oil. I mean, just... Close your eyes, think 30 years ahead, and okay. there's a politician yes, thing that we've got to take the gold. It's scary, but interesting. I think, can I, I, I my sure. answer to this is that actually, um, in history, it hasn't taken the central bank to have a huge amount of gold to back the currency. What's really required are the rules around it mm -hmm. and to make sure that those rules are kept. There is always enough gold within private, in private hands. I mean, we will have acquired quite a lot of gold. We've got a lot of our customers have got gold and so on, and they will start spending it as money. So gold will come back into circulation. What we cannot do is have uh, gold coming back into circulation and the government thinking it continues to run uh, budget deficits because the budget deficit leads to a trade deficit. And the foreigners are not going to accept British pounds, um, if you like, to pay for the goods, goods that we buy off them. They will want gold or they will want something which is backed by gold. I won't go into the details of that too much, but I think it's probably a bit too pessimistic to think that because the central bank doesn't exhibit that it's got an awful lot of gold, that actually it can't go on to a gold standard. I think it probably can. And what you're saying is goods and services pay for goods and yes, services. Yes, exactly that. Credit doesn't Exactly that. And it's a very important point because um, uh, Ludwig von Mises in, in, in his um, uh, big tome, the, the, I can't remember quite what it was called, it was Exchange and Prices and Exchange or something? The second big book he did, not Theory Human Act. The Theory of Money and Exchange. Yeah. Yes, that's the one. I mean, he made the point that uh, all money is, is it's the intermediary, if you like, between goods. And because everybody chooses what to buy, they choose this good over that good. Money just facilitates the transaction. Exactly. So actually, prices, you've got to look at prices in terms of, um, you know, I quite like that motor car at that price. And what I have got here, I don't think I'm going to buy that, no. So I'm going to, so in other words, you're comparing one thing with another and the money is just doing the, the transaction. So this idea that you need loads and loads of money in order to keep the economy going is actually completely wrong. So anyway, that's, that's that question. Right, um, there's another question here. What will cause people in the real economy to lose confidence in fiat currencies? How relevant is the inflation of financial asset values to the average man in the street? Is it possible that intervention in markets can continue without people losing confidence in fiat money? Well, I think we've answered quite a lot of that, but I'm just wondering if anyone's got 
Any thoughts on the second bit? Is it possible that intervention in markets can continue without people losing confidence in fiat money? I don't think so. I think we've, we've crossed the Rubicon. Co crossed the Rubicon, I think that's right. Absolutely, that would be my view too. Right, now let's find another one. If you just look at the messaging in the Bernie Sanders campaign, it's, it's almost like he's not a socialist, some of the things he's saying. He's like a, you know, a, 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 a classical capitalist, the way the banks are running, the corporate socialism, the too big to fail. These are correctly diagnosed problems. Yeah. And this, is, this has been the a thing that, I mean, yeah. you know, you, the, the remedy, the we, remedy we, is the problem. Well, the remedy, I've spoken yeah. to a few people that are involved in this campaign now, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, their remedy is at least will not uh, debase assets, which is, which is the first step. But I digress. I, I just think that going back to this uh, customer's question, everyone is now wise to the, to the trick. Yeah. Everyone yeah, knows absolutely. how it works. And I think one thing which um, uh, is, is interesting is that people have been educated by cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin. Yes. You know, and the, the, the story about Bitcoin is not so much about Bitcoin, it's about what government is doing to money. And I think there is a whole new generation of uh, intelligence, uh, tech savvy people, and there, there are hotspots of them in places like California and so on and so forth. Um, they do actually understand money in a way in which their fathers didn't understand money because their fathers had never come up against it. And the idea that uh, it's going to take some time for people to realize what government is doing to the money, I think that time is maybe shortening as a result. Um, last question here, and I think this is probably a one word answer from you all. Gold, do you really know how much each country owns? <laughs> well, you can't trust government statistics. <laughs> um, whether you're calculating inflation rates or the amount of gold that they have, even central banks, if you look at their balance sheet, uh, they put gold in the vault and gold out on loan as one line item. So they're basically deceiving how much gold they really have. They're trying to create an illusion that there's more gold in the system than there perhaps really is. And, so, and where, and, and where um, it's, it's out on loan to another central bank, it's double counting. It, it is, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's, there's so much hypothecation and rehypothecation mm -hmm. of the physical gold, it's impossible to yes, say I how think, much is I out there. Is, I think uh, you, 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 you find out which each country says, or each country's central bank, and they say how much gold that they've got, and then you take a quarter of it, and you'll probably get somewhere close pretty to close, the pretty yeah. close to the number. Yeah. Other than China, where it's much Ah, larger. Well, it's completely reversed. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Ch China's number you can multiply by ten. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and it's a very simple Which equation. Is where? Yeah. That, that because, went. because they claim they own three thousand tons, uh, but they produce uh, around a thousand tons a year net. And it, no gold leaves China. Never. We've tried to take gold out of China. We have a vault in Hong Kong. We've looked at opening vaults in Shanghai. Um, you can't get gold out of China. Yeah, Alistair, you asked, estimated how much was owned officially well, and unofficially. Uh, I think it was like yeah. 25,000 tons is owned in China. Yeah, um, well, you've got two elements of it. Uh, I think private, way, and, private and public. Yeah, the way, yes, absolutely. And the way to understand it is that the rules um, which appointed the uh, People's Bank of China with overall authority to manage the state's gold reserves, gold and silver, incidentally, uh, was dated 1978 might have been 83. Now since then, they've obviously been secretly accumulating gold as any sensible country would. Remember that at that time they were not Keynesian in any way. Um, they were just sort of trying to ape, ape you know, the sort of capitalist way. And, and the Chinese understand gold. I think you told me that um, in Chinese, uh, the um, Chinese for money is gold. Yeah, so Chinese we're, The Chinese we're, word for money is gold. Yeah, so we're gold, gold or money, money. I think I prefer gold, gold. Anyway, um, they will have accumulated... For money in Hebrew is silver. Kesef. Oh, really? Yeah. Makes sense. So they will have accumulated enough um, state reserves before they allowed the people to begin to accumulate gold, which they did in 2002 with the establishment of the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And since then, they've even advertised um, for individuals to go out and buy gold. So they've ensured that the population as a whole has gold. In my view, the uh, figure that they probably got to was in the region of 20,000 tonnes of state-owned gold before they um, let the 
people begin to buy through the newly established Shanghai Gold Exchange. And since then, uh, the people have accumulated, and this is looking at Shanghai deliveries out of the system, out of their vaults, uh, a, a figure in the region of about 17,000 tons. So we're looking... 37,000 tons? So we're looking 37,000 tons total. Sector, yeah. So one yeah. third of the world's gold supply. Yeah, yeah pretty close. Yeah. Above ground stock. Yeah. 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 Now that wouldn't surprise me at all because... Uh, and the other thing I discovered, I was interviewing um, someone who, who was a director of, of um, one of the big Swiss refineries back in 2014. And he told me something very interesting and that was that Arabs were sending um, LBMA bars back to him to be re-refined into the new Chinese standard. One kilo, four nines. And that was back in 2014, which is fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. It's fascinating that Gresham's law even applies to gold. Yes. To the way gold is marked <laughs> yes. out with the LBMA mark, in with yeah, the Shanghai that's, mark. That's a whole because the premiums, there, the premiums there are better. I mean, yep. you can get 10% above yep. uh, spot. Um, uh, so, sorry, not 10%, but uh, like 100 basis points. Sometimes you can get 2 or 3% over there. So, yeah, I agree. I also believe Russia's numbers. I think Russia yeah. owns as much gold oh, yeah, as it's yeah, disposing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I also believe the, the Federal Reserve's number. I, I think... I, tiny instead of outstanding currency. <laughs> exactly. So, so I think that the optimist in me wants to see Nixon's statement reversed. Yeah and the U.S. go back to the constitutional definition of what a dollar is. And I think that the gold uh, in Fort Knox, if it's really there, I know you all probably don't believe it's there. Um, it's fun not believing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Maybe when I get to your age, it'll be something that, that I do too. But I, I want to believe it's there, but it's just not worth that much. I mean, doesn't the ECB have more gold than, uh, than the Federal Reserve? No. When you add no. it all together? No. What's the ECB's it's, gold value? It's about one third of the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So it's like, what, a hundred billion yeah. dollars? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in dollar terms, it would be... Uh, I, I thought it was 470 yeah. billion. No, no, I think no. what you'll find is that um, uh, the ECB on uh, inception took a proportion of uh, the national central bank's gold. Uh, the national central banks still have large amounts of gold, the French, the Italians, the Germans. Yeah, you're talking about adding all of Europe. Adding all of them, yeah. yeah it's yeah, that's comparable to what the U.S. gold No, it's has. more. It's $475 billion, and I think the U.S.'s gold position is yeah. 300 or... 350, 375. So, so that's yeah. another interesting, interesting way to yeah, look at it. Yeah, but I can't see... I, I really can't see the Assuming Bundesbank... I can't see the Assuming Bundesbank there, giving yes. it up. Yes. Know. Anyway, I think we've probably um, done enough. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining um, with me in this round table. And I hope that Gold Money's customers find that it is useful, brings them up to date, informative, and good luck for 2020. Yeah, let's wish everybody well for 2020. Yes. And yeah, we we'll yeah. wish everybody lots of wealth for 2020. If you're not a Gold Money customer and you have no gold, you might not get that wealth. Mm -hmm.